We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Well, today we're, uh, we're kicking off a brand new series, and I am so, so excited for this series, so excited for our time uh, this morning, which we'll get to in just a moment. Before we do, let me tell you what this series is about. This series is answering the question, or we could even see make, say making the statement, why we're here, why we're here. And why we're here is really a statement or it can even be a question of purpose. Like when when you ask the question why, you're you're looking for purpose. And when you're talking about here, what you're doing is you're connecting purpose to where it is your place. Like why are you here? Why are you in Charlottesville? Why Louisa? Why Crozet? Uh, Why are you where you are placed? And every one of us at some point in time or another, we've wrestled with purpose. And if we've even wrestled with purpose in regards to our location, right now, there's a lot of people who are transitioning into Charlottesville. Some of you, this is your very first Sunday here. Your very first Sunday in Charlottesville, you just moved over the course of the summer and maybe you're, you're wrestling through that transition. It could be a hard transition. So this is, a, this is really a series of answering the question for all of us why we're here. And it's true, uh, it's good for you whether you're, you're single, in, as an individual, and maybe as a couple, you've been asking the question of purpose, why we're here. Maybe you've been asking the question of purpose regarding you as a family. Um, maybe it's regarding your place on your team or among your roommates or your education, why we're here. And even for us as a church, every so often, we need to remind ourselves of why we're here, Amen. Because it's very, very easy, even as a body, as, a, as an organism, to turn inward and, and to forget that ultimately why we're here is to reach people who are not yet here with the gospel. And so what, what I want to do very quickly is I want to turn your attention to Acts chapter 1. Okay, now the words are not going to be on the screen. I'm just going to read them very quickly. But if you, if you have a Bible, you can follow along. If you don't, just, just listen uh, listen to these words from Acts chapter 1. In verse number 1, Luke writes, Now, in my former book, Theophilus, which was his gospel account, the gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. Everybody say promised. Very important word. Which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, this was a politically and militarily charged question, okay? What they had in mind regarding the kingdom of God was a political rule and reign then then and there, okay? That's what they have in mind. That's that's their idea. And this was a hot topic in, in their day and age. It would be like any questions in our day and age around end times, Like, are we living in the end times and discussion around the end times? And we look at culture and society and we kind of wonder, are we living in in the last days? Well, this is the same question in their day and age. They're looking for now the Messiah to establish his rule and reign then then and there. And he said to them, verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But here's a better alternative. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So back to the promise and now the power. Listen to me. If the promise of God is for me, then so is the mission. If the promise of God is for me, then so is the mission. Which means that we've gotta be very, very careful that we don't divorce our purpose from where we're placed. Okay, where you are, you have been perfectly placed by God to make an impact. And what I wanted to do this morning is is read this from Acts chapter one as a reminder that ultimately, as the church, we have a responsibility also to the nations of the world. 
So what I want to do today is I want to remind you, we, we've, we've said this from the very beginning, that ultimately any vision that doesn't include reaching the world for Jesus is too small. Because if, if, you, if you have limited to God to anything, if you've limited God to anything other than the world, what you've done is you've placed God in a box. And any vision that doesn't include impacting the world for Jesus is too small. And we as a church, we have a vision of in our first 50 years, we want to have 50 ongoing partnerships with 50 nations of the world. Now, we were doing really well and on track, and then this thing called COVID came along, okay? And so we were, we were running strong and sending teams and, and, and all of that. And, and, and again, we had to put a little pause on, on things, on the going piece with our hands and feet, although we continued to support very, very generously um, when it came to you know, financial support to, to these nations. But what I want to do today as we kick off this series is I want to reorient us ultimately to, to the reminder that we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. Every one of us, the church, part of something so much bigger than ourselves, a responsibility to, to the nations. And so what we have is, is we have several nations we're now partnering with. And today what I want to do is introduce you to a brand new partnership, our very first partnership in Europe. And so to do that, I'm going to invite to the stage a brand new partner from Poland. His name is Andrew Gorski, and he is a church planter in Poland and also the founder of Evangelical Poland, which is a collaboration movement of evangelical churches and pastors. And so Pastor Andrew, if you would, come on up. And church, I want you to give him a warm point welcome. Come on, both campuses, give him a warm welcome. God bless you, Pastor. Good to be here. It's so good to have you. Thank you. And we are so excited, so honored, so thrilled to have you. And just to give you context, when the Russian invasion of Ukraine took place and we began to see the refugee uh, crisis unfolding, we as a church, you as a church, you began to step up and to give so generously to the humanitarian needs in Ukraine. And it was through a partnership, someone in our church family that knew Pastor Andrew, that we were able to establish this partnership. And these guys are doing just an incredible job of responding to the needs. And responding to the needs of the Ukrainian refugees has now led to this new partnership in, in Poland. And so Pastor Andrew, it's a pleasure and honor to pastor with you and uh, what God, or partner with you and what God is doing. So Pastor Andrew has an incredible story of coming to faith in Jesus. And I've asked him to begin there this morning by sharing that testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, you were talking about the global church, that there's something bigger than the local church. I uh, was born and raised in Poland uh, in a Catholic church. And in the 90s, uh, there were the good days of Chicago Bulls. I don't know if you remember Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen. I fell in love with those guys. I, it was my high school days. I um, watched four hours of basketball per day. And I speak the language because one guy taught me that. Uh, for four hours a day, he was speaking to me. His name was Bob Costas. <laughs> I, never, I never paid a dime. And... Um, I loved the Bulls, I loved everyone, maybe except Dennis Rodman, but, um, uh, but um, my dream was to, oh, to one day to go to States and visit and see an NBA game live. And uh, when I went to law school after year four, an opportunity came up for me to go and come here for summer to do a work and travel kind of program. Um, and uh, I came in, I spent some time in New York, and then I went to Boston, Massachusetts. And, I would work in the mornings, but in the evenings I, had, I didn't have anything to do. I didn't know anybody. So I would go and play basketball. And then one day uh, I meet this guy and we start talking and he says uh, that he went to North Carolina University. And, uh, and for me it was like, oh, that's where Michael Jordan started. So we started talking and, <laughs> and I mean immediately, and he said, well, Andrew, you know what? We, uh, we have this uh, Bible study going on uh, at my home. So if you'd like to come uh, and be part of it, uh, it would be great. And I said, sure, you know, I had been... Catholic. I've been, I had been going to church every, I would never miss Sunday, but never read the Bible. Never. So I said, yeah, sure. Why not? I don't have anything to do. So I came in and, uh, and I, when I came in and they prayed together with their own words and they talked about God, like he was there, like he was part of their lives. It just, it, it just 
changed my life. And I was like, wow, what is this? So to make a long story short, these guys, after 10 weeks, they said, hey, you, can, you need to make a decision to follow Christ. I said, I don't know. I need to kind of think about it. But then they, like a good salesman, insurance salesman, just kind of started asking me questions to which I couldn't say no. You know, like one <laughs> after another, they, they cornered me. And I said, okay, I'll pray the prayer. I mean, I just had no other argument. So, so I prayed the prayer and everything changed, changed there. And this was 1998. And uh, just let's quickly fast forward to today. Uh, and... Uh, I started, we started a ministry and we have reached half a million p Polish people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, Amen. and now there is this collaboration movement, revolutionary for, for the country of Poland among evangelical churches. And I just want to say one thing. This was this guy who on the basketball court invited me to Bible study. And if this wouldn't happen, uh, probably so many people wouldn't uh, come to faith and wouldn't hear the gospel. So my challenge, church, to you, and encouragement is mm. invite people to church. Yeah. You don't know. You, you may meet somebody at a grocery store or something. Just invite them. You don't know. Maybe this will be next Billy Graham. How do you know? You don't know that. So, yeah. so just, I would even... Uh, I would even like to kind of set a challenge for you. Like this summer, invite at least one person. Yeah. Maybe one person per week. Maybe one person per day. But at least one person invite to church. They may say no, but maybe if all of you invite one person, I'm sure some will come. And then the rest is up to God. Amen. Whew. So powerful. Amen. <clears throat> you know, really, we could wrap up uh, the series just after that. Um, why we're here, and to think that every one of us, we have people like that in our lives, and uh, just incredible to hear. So can you, Pastor Andrew, can you give us an idea of the destruction, you know, of the war in Ukraine? Like right now, uh, we see things on the news, um, what we're seeing, and you know, I know that you've only been here in the U.S. for a few weeks now, but what we're seeing, could you just speak to that? Yeah, um, of course you see the pictures, you see, you see the destructions. We live in Poland, and there is 2 million people living in Poland right now, 2 million Ukrainian people, m women and children only, or mostly. And, uh, and it's, just, uh, it's just difficult, you know? It's not only we live there and we, we're asking ourselves the questions, are we going to be next? Because, uh, you know, Putin wants to get the empire back. And we used to be under communistic uh, oppression. So we were like, maybe we'll be next. So that's number one. You see, you see women and kids on the streets just walking and, and just everywhere. Uh, uh, you know, just no dads, no husbands. It's just super sad. And the, 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 uh, the damage that is done in families and the kids' lives. They don't have dad for four months now. They... Those women are away from their husbands for four months. The husbands are away from their women. And just like imagine all kinds of difficulties it, it, uh, it brings. It's just, it's just hard on everybody. It's hard on, uh, on the generations. And, and it's just I want to share one statistic with you. Uh, statistic. Um, there was a Syrian refugee crisis which lasted 10 years. The peak of it was in 2014 and 2015. A lot of them came into Europe. Germany took 1 million of those refugees. It was 13 million people displaced from their home in 10 years. Now, this uh, war, it is 13 million people, the same number, 13 million people displaced from their homes within three months alone. Wow. So six million Ukrainians left uh, left uh, Ukraine and went to or, you know to different countries. Most went to Poland. Uh, seven million were displaced in their in their country. So it's just the 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 consequences of it will be probably known uh, and will be felt for 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 generations. And nobody knows how long it will last. It could be you know another year or two. We don't know that. You know, one of the things that uh, struck me when we first chatted was how. You know, we see images uh, on the news um, of, of a destruction and, of course, the displacement of, of the refugees. Uh, but one of the things that struck me was when you mentioned that one thing that we can't see on the news is the constant fear that people are living under. And uh, could you just speak to that? It's just, it's yes. just ongoing. Well, it's... Um we have a family of refugees living, living with us in our, in our home. Uh, so we talk to the, to the lady, her name is Anna, and uh, we just dis discuss and you know, get to know each other, sh share, learn of each other's cultures. And then she says, 
because Ukraine was used to be part of uh, Soviet Union, uh, you know, back in the day before '89. So she says that the constant thing that the Russian people live with, they have been for years, for centuries, and they live now with is fear. Uh, there is just there's this uh, uh, there's this thing that they are afraid of saying anything bad about the government or anything else or just kind of, you know, um, complaining because they do not know if they're not be uh, in Siberia in the next uh, in the next day. And this was the same when we were under communists, uh, uh, you know, uh, under Soviet Union until World War II till 1989. Uh, we just couldn't. And that's why the church also struggles in Poland because we never developed the trust toward each other. Because you couldn't trust your neighbor. You didn't know if the Red Party didn't have something against them. Then you share something, you know, with him, and then he's forced to tell what, what you know, what you said, and then, you know, your family is in, in again in Siberia next day, and it's a, it's a bad place. You don't want to live there. So the refugee crisis. Um how, what did it look like in those first few months, and now how has it changed in the more recent months? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. You know, um, February twenty fourth, we you know we do our ministries, and then everything changes overnight. First month, complete chaos, complete chaos. People are by thousands, tens of thousands would come to their to to our border and would just en enter Poland. So Poles would just get on their cars drive there, pick up a woman with their kids and said, yeah, let's, I'll take you to my home. And first the women were like, well, hey, hang on, I, we don't, for, for Ukrainian culture, they do not, the, the culture is, you don't get anything just for nothing. And we Poles, that's our culture somewhat, and we're very hospitable uh, um, in society people, and we go like, yeah, I will take you. And they were like, first, very, very afraid. And, uh, but it was communication, communication, accommodation, chaos. Everybody did everything. Um, and very quickly, our homes, our churches, everything just filled up, and there was no room. So we go like, we have to do something. So we started connecting with the Western churches. And that's where we're talking about the global church. It's not just our church in a situation of crisis. Hey, we, we started working with other network of churches and said, hey, you know, uh, friends, friends churches, do you have a network? Can you take people? They, they call up and they say, yes, well, we can take 400 people. But somebody calls up from Switzerland and says, hey, we can take 200 people. And then I don't know this person. Like, how are we supposed to send three buses of people, of women and children, to somebody we don't know? So it was chaos, like trying to figure out if we know somebody who knows that person, or maybe somebody who knows somebody who knows. So we know that we are sending them in a in a safe place. So, so it was it, it was difficult. And then, slowly and surely, and because also the collaboration movement that, that God was kind of uh, allowed us to, to, to start it. We started talking to each other. Uh, we believe in synergy. One plus one equals five or four. And, and then if we work together, uh, you know, one can do transportation well, one can do accommodation, one can do humanitarian, humanitarian aid. So it's, it's getting a little, bit, a little bit better, more systematic. So th this will maybe even help, because we have a lot of, of, um, of educators in our church family. Um, what was fascinating to me is to hear even the tension on the school systems. Could you speak to that for just oh, a yeah. moment? Oh, yeah. Um, one thing uh, we have to remember that they do not want to be in Poland, in Romania, France, in Switzerland. They, they just want to be at home. So, <clears throat> so they, the, the high schools, again, if you're uh, under 18, you could leave the, the country. So they're in our school system. In Poland and other countries, we opened up, we gave free transportation. They can be part of our schools, and, and that's, that's all great. But it, after a while, you know, they are just like, I don't want to be here. So they are um, like in a, in a denial. They just, they don't want to listen to the teacher. And the teacher goes like, okay, so everyone will do this. And they go like, no, we're not going to do it. What are you going to do to me? You know, you're not going to kick me away. I'm, I don't, I don't want to be here anyway. So this brings all kinds of tensions and schools uh, with them. They, they don't speak the language or language, although it's the same family of languages. So it's a little bit similar, but, but it's just, it, it, it not only... The destruction is not only within Ukraine nation, but also it just kind of, you know, impacts our nation as well and so, our young people. So just the tension on every aspect of, of society. So let's talk about the church for a moment. Like just how has the church shined uh, through this? Uh, yeah, the church in Poland, evangelical church, listen to this, is, makes up two-tenths of one percent of Polish society. So uh, we're just so small. We are, generally speaking, people don't know of us. Uh, if we think, if, we, if I come and try to share it with the face with somebody, they, first of all, they think I'm Jehovah's Witness. And then, and the second of all, they, they think like this is a cult. We don't know what it is. So, so, so the church, as small as it is, 
really uh, passed the test. Uh, let me tell you and let me encourage you that Polish people, even though we have small houses, my goodness, your houses are so big here, our houses, we open up our homes and people stay in our homes and we have every church, if, they, if, there's, if there's, for example, my city of one million people, there's 20 churches with the average number of 50 uh, members, and there were, there's only three buildings. So those who have buildings, they'd open now as well and, and welcome the, the, the refugees there. Uh, and, uh, and really, we are so proud of how we reacted as the church. Uh, and, um, and I think not only as a church, but also as an entire, entire nation. So, so it's just good to, good to see Christ working in us and through us. And also, one thing from the very beginning we said, we are not a humanitarian aid organization. We are a church. We will help them, but we would will, we will want to use this um, opportunity to maybe introduce them to, uh, to, to Jesus as well. So we would look for families, Christian families, where we could put them in, in, Euro, in Poland and in all European countries so they could maybe in, this, in the lowest day of their life, maybe they could find Christ. I thought what was also fascinating is when you shared that even evangelical Ukrainians coming in, they're coming as missionaries as well. In a sense. Yeah, well, they, they are, they, they, we are two-tenths of one percent, but in Ukraine, it's four percent. Europe is a, is, a, is a weird place. You know, we have, we're Poland, and just south of Poland is Czech Republic, and there's 80 percent atheistic. We're 90 percent Catholic. So it's just, uh, so we as a collaboration movement, we as a church of Poland, we have made a, kind of signed a vision four years ago that there would be one percent evangelical by 2050. Maybe it doesn't sound big to you, but for us, it's a huge vision. It's a God-sized vision. Amen. Uh, because it's, we're, we're fighting against 1,000 years of history of the Catholic Church, just the only church there. So our goal was to go from a two-tenth to one percent. And because Ukrainians make, in Ukraine, there's four percent evangelical Christians, and two million came in. And if you quickly made, do the math, our church just doubled in three months. So we're almost, you know, we're half day, half, halfway there to, uh, you know, to the, to the 1%. So it's, it's, of course, a joke, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, this is, that's what it is. Amen. So for a few years now, you've been leading an evangelical movement, a collaboration of, of churches and pastors, um, focusing on church planting, on discipleship, leadership development. So let's talk a little bit about that, because if we think about our partnership, yes. we're very excited for what God is doing in and through this movement. You know, yesterday, I was, no, not here. I was in, yesterday I was in Charlottesville meeting with somebody who was a missionary to Italy, and they had this saying, which I thought just beautifully, uh, beautifully, unfortunately, uh, um, describes uh, who we are. We are small, as the church, evangelical church, historically, we are small, but well divided. So um, we do not historically work together very well. Denominations do their own thing. So my heart cries to see, because everybody in the world comes together because you know, if you're together, you're stronger. But uh, this hasn't been the case in, in Poland. So uh, I just, I was weeping. I heard what God was doing in France. Uh, and I don't know if you know, in France, every 12 days, there's a new church being planted. Uh, so maybe next, next European country yeah. for you to, find, to, to, to partner with. Mm. Uh, and I thought, like, could we do this? And so, so God really allowed me miraculously to start this, this movement, this collaboration network of pastors, churches, kingdom-minded people, like your pastor here. Not just us, but there is more. There is church out there that, and that we would work together, and, uh, and we've been coming together and, 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 and focusing on, on, on developing leaders. It, it's got to start there. In discipleship, through discipleship, going deep uh, with, uh, with people, and as a result, planting new churches as, in my personal, my personal opinion, the best, way, the best way of evangelism, to plant new churches, start new churches. In Poland, there is 905 towns. 700 do not have a single evangelical church. Wow. Well, we are so, so thankful for your partnership, your love for Jesus, your love for the church, for church planning, for discipleship, and uh, that is our heartbeat as a, as a church as well. So we're grateful for our partnership. And I want to share as well with our entire church family um, that beginning in 2023, we are going to begin re-engaging with our hands and feet um, by going back to the nations, the partnerships that we have in different nations of the world. And so we've been asked the question, when are we going to begin to step back into the mission field? Of course, we 
we've been supporting very generously financially, but now we're going to begin to re-engage by sending teams. And I pray that you'll consider this, that you'll pray about this. If you ask me what would one dream be for, for our people of the point, my prayer is that everyone who calls the point their home will one day step foot on the, on the foreign mission field. And there's always um, those. I know that some of you, the, you're, you're running numbers in your head. Well, if, if we spent all of that money, you know, going to the nations themselves instead of on trips and things like that, that, you know, it's a lot more, it could be a lot more impact. And I get that. Like, I get the, the financial side of things. But here's what you cannot put a dollar amount on. It's the change that happens in our hearts when we go and we step outside of our mundane and our routine. And you just, your world just, I mean, it just gets opened up and you just get outside of yourself. And I'm just telling you that every time, every time I've gone, that God has, uh, has molded and shaped me in such a significant way. It's been so life-changing. And our church family is full of people who, who have that, that very same testimony. As you leave this morning at both campuses, we've got magnets that we're going to be giving you um, that's going to serve as a reminder to pray for our partnerships around the globe. Um, there's a QR code on the bottom that you can just scan this, and it has all the information about each partnership, the name of the partner, um, that you can pray for them by name, incorporate it into your prayer time daily, incorporate it into your prayer time with your children. Uh, let them know about the impact that you're making through your generosity. And uh, we just want to encourage you to take this and you can again scan this and it'll have all the information. And on it as well, you'll also be sent to an interest form. So if you're interested in going on a trip in 2023, uh, you just fill out the interest form. That doesn't commit you, but it does again just kind of get your name in into um, so that we can follow up and, and, and give you more information uh, about next steps. And so as we close today, I've asked Pastor Andrew to pray over us in his language, and then, then we're going to pray over him as, as well. And at the conclusion of that time, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity today to say yes to Christ for the first time. I really believe, as we've shared this morning, uh, there are those that God has been stirring your heart and drawing your heart. And you're right now been brought to this place where you're ready to cross the line of faith, surrender control of your life to Jesus Christ. And I'm gonna give you that opportunity in, in just a moment. So pastor, if you would, would you pray uh, for us and then we will pray for you. Drogi Panie Jezu, ja Tobie dziękuję za to, że tu możemy być dzisiaj. Dziękuję Tobie, Jezu, za Twoje, za to, co Ty zrobiłeś na krzyżu dla nas. Panie, ja chcę się modlić o The Point, Kościół The Point, tutaj w Charlottesville. Błogosławię tych ludzi, Panie, błogosławię ich wizję dotarcia do 50 narodowości na całym świecie. Boże, oddaję Tobie ten Kościół. Działaj w nich i przez nich dla Twojej chwały w imieniu Jezusa Chrystusa. Amen. And Father, I lift up Pastor Andrew now. I lift up he, his wife, his children. I lift up this ministry and this calling you've placed on him, God. And I pray a hedge of protection over them now. I pray, Father, that you would just continue to anoint and give him favor, God, and open doors that no man can shut. Father, I pray that you would use him to continue to take the gospel, Lord, throughout uh, Poland, that the impact would spread throughout Ukraine and throughout Europe, that, Father, the gospel would spread, that they would see great revival, a great movement, God. I pray your anointing and your power against them. I pray of any attempt of the enemy, Lord, to destroy, distract the work. God, I pray that no weapon formed against them would prosper. God, I pray, God, that you would just, again, give favor, God, and open doors, Lord, that could only be explained by you. And God, we pray for a great harvest. And God, we thank you so much for this partnership. We thank you for the opportunity to be a part of something so much bigger than us, God. And God, we love you, God. We give you praise. We give you thanks. And God, I pray especially right now for any who have never trusted you as Lord and Savior, that even right now this morning, They've heard the good news of Jesus, and today they're ready to place their full faith, their trust in you, surrendering control of their life to you, to receive you as Lord and Savior. God, I pray that right now that your drawing would be so great they could not resist you any longer. So as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and we're very still and quiet for a moment. You've never said yes to Jesus, and today you're ready to surrender to him as your Lord and your Savior, to receive the free gift of salvation and eternal life. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And I'm going to ask the rest of us, we would pray it out loud as well, nice and loud, just in support and encouragement of those who are making this decision for the first time. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. I believe he died for me, that he rose again. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I give you all control and give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.